I dealt with anxiety pretty much since I was eight years old. And I didn't, I never really knew what it stood for or what it meant as far as the anxiety piece. So that traveled with me through sports. And I kind of use sports as a band-aid to, to get over the pressures and things of that nature. Welcome to Believe in Progress, the American Association for Cancer Research Foundation podcast. Join us and be inspired by the incredible stories of those who have faced cancer with strength and resilience and the medical professionals who are working tirelessly to find new treatments and ultimately a cure. Believe in Progress isn't just about the science of cancer. It's about the human side of this disease. Together, we can make progress in the fight against cancer and bring hope to those who need it most. Welcome to the Believe in Progress podcast featuring Marcus Smith II, who's joining us remotely. Picture spending years tirelessly striving to play in the NFL, and then in 2014, following years of dedication, you get picked in the first round of the National Football League draft by the Philadelphia Eagles. It's a day that tops all others in your life. Time passes and the strain escalates. Eventually, anxiety becomes so overwhelming that you try to end your own life. Such is the tale of Marcus Smith II, a former Philadelphia Eagle and a veteran of six NFL seasons. Marcus Smith II is a professional athlete, philanthropist, entrepreneur, and guest speaker dedicated to ending the stigma surrounding mental health, especially in professional sports. In addition to playing in the NFL, he creates opportunities for single mothers and their children through his foundation, The Circle of M, and seeks to improve the world through the written and spoken word. A Georgia native, Marcus battled anxiety and depression from an early age. He struggled with these unwanted yet ever-present companions well into adulthood and even contemplating taking his own life. Nevertheless, he overcame all odds to become one of the best football players in the world. He was a first-round draft pick in 2014. He went on to play for the Philadelphia Eagles, Seattle Seahawks, and the Washington Redskins. Marcus has touched countless lives along his football journey. His faith always at the forefront of his life. He is committed to helping others overcome their mental health struggles and believes his story can inspire them to get the help they need. Marcus has a bachelor's degree in communications, which prepared him for life after football. He lives in Waldorf, Maryland, with his wife, Allison, and their daughter, Sarai. To get more information about Marcus's foundation, The Circle of M, please go to the show notes for this episode, where you can find links and more information. Well, Marcus, welcome, and uh, thank you so much for joining the Believe in Progress podcast. So excited to have you here today, and uh, really appreciate you giving us a few minutes of your time. Appreciate you guys for having me. It's, it's exciting to be able to speak and, and talk about some of, some of the things that's going on in the world to push the message forward. So I'm, I'm always up for it. So thank you again for having me. Got a real important question for you. Do you still live in Waldorf, Maryland? I actually live 15 minutes from Waldorf, so not that far, still in Charles County. I'll tell you so, why, because yeah. uh, in the beginning of my career, I was a school teacher and I taught in Charles County. That's where I started my career. I, I taught oh, school wow. at Dr. Samuel Mudd Elementary School, which is right in Waldorf, and then I went to John Hanson Middle School. So when I saw you were from Waldorf or you were living in the Waldorf area, I said, wow, that's, that's kind of a small world. Yeah, it is a small world. That's cool. Yeah. That's cool, man. Yeah. Right outside of DC. So what was it like for you when you heard your name called in the uh in 2014 when you were uh, drafted by the Eagles uh first round in the NFL? What was what kind of emotions and feelings did you have? Well, it was something that I always wanted to do since I was 5 years old. And I know you hear the cliché stories about wanting to play in the NFL, but it was really something that I always wanted to do. I would stay up with my father and watch Monday Night Football. That was our, our thing. And I was a guy that would always watch the game until the end of the game, right? I was just so really? fascinated. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I, I still do that. Okay. On Sundays, I can't I stay am up sitting that down. <laughs> but that's how I used to be when I, when I was younger. So, so that, that moment of me getting drafted was surreal. I remember crying in my in my father's arms because I just completed one of the 
things that nobody in my family had done that thus far. And I, and I really appreciated the hard work that I put in to get to that point. So it was a surreal moment. And I was very happy when it happened. You, uh, you grew up in Georgia, right? Yes, and then sir. Where, where'd yep. you go to college? I went to university of Louisville. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. Bob, Bobby <laughs> funny, Petrino, funny your coach? About that. Uh, coach strong was actually my coach. Okay. So I was, Teddy Bridgewater oh, yeah. error when he was there. Yeah. So you had some yeah. really good teams. Yep. Yep. It was it was fun. It was it was a good time. Um and um your journey in professional sports came with immense pressure. I understand that. And could you share with us a little bit um about how that affected your mental health? Because so much of what you do to help, you know, younger people and, and people at, at, in general is to help them with their mental health. I just kinda curious about how it affected you. Yeah, man. So I dealt with anxiety pretty much since I was eight years old and I didn't, I never really knew what it stood for or what it meant as far as the anxiety piece. So that traveled with me through sports and I kind of use sports as a band aid to, to get over the pressures and things of that nature. But once I got over the college route and I entered into the NFL, we all know that that pressure is more pressure that is added on to you on top of the things that you have already had, um, you know, being a young pup. So got, getting going to the league, I was a first round draft pick. There was a lot of expectations. I had already been dealing with anxiety. Sometimes that anxiety turned into depression, uh, but I was just muscling through at the time because as an athlete, that is naturally what we are supposed to do or what we think we are supposed to do. So those struggles led uh, all the way up until even my, my fourth year in my career. It led, it led all the way up in, into to that point where I really couldn't take it anymore. And I, I tried to end my own life. And I, what I do now is really just continue to be vulnerable about what I dealt with, and I know that other players are also dealing with it too, but we know that even with COVID, with everything like that, the suicide rate has went up yes. tremendously. And so I just continue to be a voice in that way because I know what I didn't know. And I feel like if, if I increase the awareness with people and, and how they may view some of the things that they're dealing with, that we can save some people, we can save guys and save women. So that's, you know, a part of my struggle, but at the same time, we are on this journey together and I try to emulate that and preach that as much as I can. And you interact with professional uh, athletes now and help them yes, with, their, yes. with their journey? Yes, sir. Um, I, I have a foundation that's called the, the Circle of M. And it's truly a circle. It's I became a certified life coach so I could be a bridge for guys to be able to help them get the healing that they solely desire. And I partnered up with uh, companies who have the therapists like Sage Elite, uh, NAMI, which is a big time uh, mental health company, yeah. too, as well. And uh, I partnered up with these companies uh, just so I could be a bridge to, to be able to direct them in, in the in the route that they that they solely desire, because. A lot of us don't have the knowledge or the wherewithal to say, hey, I need help or know what symptoms that they have that are curating those anxiety and depressions, maybe bipolar or uh, sleep, you know, depending on what you may be dealing with. So I just try to be a bridge and help as, help as much guys as possible. And it's crazy because a lot of times we could be on a healing circle call and I would speak about what I dealt with in Seattle because I dealt with the anxiety and depression in Seattle. That's where it all happened. Mm -hmm. But they would open up to me in that moment. And then through trust and through just talking about it, now I can really direct you where you should go. So, Marcus, um, I think you know that uh, my organization, our organization, it's the American Association for Cancer Research, which we're all about trying to find cures for for all the different forms of cancers. But I know that many of the people that are watching and listening to this podcast are survivors and people dealing with their cancer, and they're dealing with a lot of probably mental health issues as well. Um, have you um, dealt with 
cancer survivors and people that have had to deal with cancer and, you know, what, what's your advice to those folks with regard to mental health issues? Yeah, I, I dealt my aunt, uh, my auntie Mel, she dealt with colon cancer. Um, unfortunately she passed away. Mm. Um, but that was something that would put a dagger in our families and in, in my family, and probably a lot of families uh, around the country, what happens is a lot of people who maybe get cancer, um, they don't tell their loved ones or they wait to till, till the last minute to, to actually let them know that they're dealing with something. So we didn't necessarily know until she was kind of like stage four mm. and it was almost too late. But the mental health side of that is that we mask everything anyway. That's kind of what we have always done. And we it's like this thing of, oh, we don't want people to feel sorry for us. But in those moments, going back, I wish I could have just oh, somebody could have could have said something because there could have possibly been research out there. There could possibly been something that could have helped and we could have just banded together to to make something happened for her. Right. And, um, that was, that was an actual, that was a really hard time for my whole family and me because she was the life of a party. And she, the, the goal was to be able to come to all my games and do everything right. She didn't, she didn't even get to see me actually fulfill my dream in the way that, that I, that I wanted her to. So, uh, and my advice would be to w with people who may be dealing with the same thing or going through the same thing. It's OK to have someone to to talk to about it. And, and for you speaking up about something that you're dealing with early, it could save your life. It could, it could help someone else. And I just think that we have to continue to speak about it because the more you speak about it, the more you free yourself from it. And that is the healthy part about it. That is truly the healthy part about it, freeing yourself and, and continuing that journey to, to get healing. Marcus, um, so she had colon cancer, right? Is that what you said? So yes. do you think she yes. didn't get screened properly? You know, cause I know that that, that happens a lot to folks. Um, and you know, we have a big issue in our, in our country, uh, with, with healthcare disparities and, you know, lack of, um, uh, you know, a lack of, uh, equality, I guess, if you could say that. And so, um, just kind of curious if you knew anything more about that and, you know, did she, you know, did she probably wait too late and, you know, could that be like a cultural thing? I, I definitely think it is a, a cultural thing to wait late to see if something is going on because you, you may have a sense of, something is going on, but you kind of like ignore it. Right. And then I, I do, I do think that at that time that it was, it was something that kind of was sprung on her too later than what it have could have been if, if the checkups and things of that nature were going on uh, routinely. Mm -hmm. And, and I would say that especially in, in men also, it's like, we're afraid to to go to the doctor, right? It's like some of us are afraid to go to the doctor, um, but I think it's a cultural thing as far as not wanting to to know if you have a certain issue or not. So going back to my aunt, I think through that process, I think it could have been known sooner, and that there have could have been things that have took taken place to possibly help her better in that route if we would have knew what we know now would have knew about the research would have would have just taken taken it more serious i think yeah interesting how, how old was she she was actually 45 so very young very young person very very young mm -hmm. very young that must have uh hit the family pretty hard i imagine yeah it, it really did it was it was something that for us, it was kind of unexpected, right? And and it happens. It seemed like it happened so fast. Mm -hmm. um, so in in dealing with that, it was it was tough for us to deal with, and we still deal with it today, honestly. Mm. 
um, we do. Yeah, and Marcus, um, you talked a little bit about your own mental health struggles in Seattle. Um, how did you overcome those? How, how did you? I mean, if you were you were right up against it, the way you just you put it a little while ago. How did you? I mean, boy, you look like you're thriving right now. Just how did you do this? It was hard. I'm gonna be honest. It was a time where my wife was pregnant at the time. Um, I had got so far gone to doing what I wanted to do. I, I wanted to get rid of the pain, right? And that's a lot of times how we feel, whether, you know, it's dealing with mental health, cancer, whatever it may be. It's it's like, you want to get rid of that pain. How do I get rid of that pain? And um, it wasn't until my wife called me that day when I was trying to do, when I was trying to end my own life, she called me. I rush her off the phone. I get off the phone with her. Then her mother calls me. Right. And by the time she calls me, I'm like at the bottom of this hill, just sitting there. And that's when I actually realized what I actually tried to do to myself. Mm -hmm. um, that's when it, it came to fruition for me. And after that, I went right to Pete Carroll. Pete Carroll is an amazing coach. He's like a father figure to a lot of guys. I went right to him. I went to my, my D-line coach and I told him that was the first time I said I need help. And, and they were, they they were receptive me. when you went to them, like that Pete was really receptive to you? He, he was um, because he could feel how serious I was. And, and I explained to him what I just tried to do. So it wasn't about football anymore. It wasn't about the white lines. It wasn't about the money either because I had just signed a $2.7 million contract with them. It, it wasn't about any of that. You know, you would on the outside looking in – it looks like I have everything and I'm my career is going the way it should go. But I was still hurting in the inside, trying to release pain that I was that I had been dealing with since I was eight that I had never addressed since I was eight. And so they directed me to a therapist that will I, I went to the therapist every single day um, after that. And that's when I really started to figure out who the true Marcus Smith was because I had to unpack everything. And it, and it wasn't easy to, to do that. But at the same time, that's how I, I got through it. I stopped what I was doing. Right. Because I didn't feel like I could do football and actually unpack all of these things and be the very best football player that I can be at the same time. And I really took time out for myself which was the first time in my life that I ever did that. Because you were you were training for football and trying to be the best athlete you could be? Yep. Uh, it was, if you think, if you could think of every September, like I, I didn't miss the September of playing football. So then when you get to the NFL, the schedule and, and everything, it's, it's so much more because now this is your profession. This is your job. So a lot of that consumed me. And that's what my true focus was. Mm -hmm. And some people still can't believe that I actually walked away because in their minds, it was, hey, like you are where you want to be. You know how many people would die to be in the position where you are. But my thought process was, well, if I don't get the help I need, I, I can't I'm not going to be able to be here right. any longer. So I, I need to to step away to get the help that I need so I can be the very best person I can be first and then football player. That speaks volumes. I mean, I've always liked Pete Carroll, but that speaks volumes for him to kind of uh, accept you and, and, and help you deal with your problem. I mean, that's refreshing. Actually, it's kind of like, a, it's nice to see that that happened because probably was the first step in saving your life, right? Yes. It, it was the first step in saving my life, but also I, I, had a father figure that I seen really helped me, right? We, you may, you may find people that may not want to do that, but at the same time, he didn't turn the cheek. He listened to what I was saying. He got me with the right people. Um, he didn't care about football at the time anyway. He told me, and him and my coach told me, like we want to do what what you feel best, 
what you think is best right now. Don't even worry about practice. Don't worry about none of that. We want to get you the help that you That's need. That's great. So, uh, you, so the foundations, is there two foundations or is, is there the M2 foundation or is Circle M? Did they one evolve into the other? Oh, so well, that's one foundation. Now, I used to, the M2 foundation was something that I did at the beginning of my career. Okay. And then it transformed to the Circle of M, uh, the Circle of M yep. dot com, mm-hmm. which is we unmask the feelings that cause anxiety and depression. And how, so, do, how do people get to that? How do they, how, how, and we'll put this in our show notes, but uh, is there a website for people to go to? Yeah. So you can go to the circle of com, and uh, you will see, once you go to the site, you'll see everything that we do, the, the podcast, the uh, we're actually developing a mentorship program for men now. Um, so they'll, they'll be able to see that. Um, as far as the the mental health goes. So everything is on there. So it's interesting, Marcus. Um, I interviewed a young man who I got to know. His name is Trevor Maxwell. And if you look at our podcast series, you'll see the interview with him, but they created a a foundation called man up to cancer. And, and Mm. you two should probably get together at some point. And because the, the stigma as you were talking about for men was not talk about their cancer and they've created quite a community of people that have supported one another and helped each other. So um, I, I really, I'm going to, I'm going to make an introduction for you two guys. Cause I think it would be, you know, what you could bring to that group might be very powerful. I think that'd be awesome. Yeah. I think that'd be awesome. So I see behind you, there's a, a picture. It's called the, it looks like the feelings wheel. Oh yeah. What, what is yeah. that? What's that? Um, well, so we I'm I'm at a gym right now. Okay. Right. I have a gym, it's called A and M Sports. And uh it's, it's a gym that primarily my brother in law runs. But what I like to do before guys get on the turf or before they do anything, uh, I like to tap in with them mentally, right? Because if you don't know how to name your feelings, this is where I used to be, right? So I look at this all the time so I can name my feelings, if you can see it right there. So I, I have them tap in to see, okay, what is your mood today? What are you feeling today? So they can actually name what they are feeling. And I do this too as well. So it's important to know that as as a man, because a lot of us men are walking around not knowing exactly what the emotion is we're feeling for that day. And I think it's very important. So fitness and nutrition are very important in for, for preventing cancer. Cause you know, people can prevent cancer if they, to, to some extent, um, you look like you're staying, you stay pretty fit. And so does that play into your work and th- th- with the mental health and all those different activities? Yeah, it does. There's, this, this is something that, um, we actually just um, started to bring up to about um, nutrition. And actually, it's important to me, too, as well, because there are certain things that runs in my family, like the cancer, high blood pressure, um, uh, diabetes, all of these things uh, run in my family, too, as well. And my mother-in-law, she actually juices. So I'm we're a real big component in natural juices to help the blood flow to help with uh different cancers even um prostate cancer I, we we actually help with that too as well that's great um so there's also younger folks listening to this as well um but for young athletes and even just young people what what did, what advice do you give to them as they kind of navigate this world and you know, maybe navigating school or navigating going out for the football team or the uh, the, the the women's soccer team or whatever it might be. Um, what advice do you have for our youth, if you will? Define what you feel like success looks like. Success is not a destination. It's a mindset. So for kids going out for the football team, for kids who are already on the football team, who, you know, with social media and the things that they see, they may think that, oh, I have to get to a certain place in order to be successful. You have to realize that success is all in the mind and that where you are right now, you trying, you doing what you love to do. You have to understand that you are already successful in that. So we have to realize that 
the the destination part, success. There are different parts of your life where you're gonna have to keep moving forward, and I didn't realize that till I till I got done playing because because it was more my purpose was after I was done playing. So if you just realize that your success is is through what you believe your success to be and how you feel about yourself yourself, you're gonna be a okay. That's that's great message. Really, really great message. So we're we're my organization, we're all about funding cancer research. You know, there's over two hundred forms of different types of cancers out there. Um, and uh, this question could be more general to just research and your thinking and what you think, you know, w- what do you believe in with regard to funding research for things like cancer? I believe wholeheartedly in, in funding the research because we have to, in order to, to know what is out there and how to combat it and the best possible ways to combat it, I think it's important for for the research. I think the we should spend money or donate money in order to to get more research because there are things that are happening on a daily and there are probably so many cancers out there, right? Yep. That we have to, you have to get research for you because if not, you won't know or understand what you're up against. So I am a true believer in the research and I, and I understand that in order to do that, you have you have to know. To be able to do that, I'm sorry, you have to know what you're up against. And we we have to double down and work harder, and we can do that now in 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 a fond memory of your aunt and in honor of your aunt. And so uh, we will keep uh, pushing that gas pedal down and 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 really working hard to make advances in colon cancer and obviously in many many other cancers. Marcus, um, you are a uh, you're a refreshing young man who I'm so happy have, have overcome your issues and still dealing with them on a on a as you said on a daily basis. But the message that you're sending out to uh, not just youth but everybody um, is is really uh, it's it's an inspiring story, and uh, I'm I'm thrilled that you gave us this opportunity to get to know you a little bit and get our audience to know you a little bit. Um, and, um, uh, just such a pleasure to meet you and you keep up the great work. And if I'm ever heading down towards Charles County, which is also known for its wonderful Maryland steamed crabs, which I've had a few of in my day, yeah. um, I will, uh, make a point of stopping in and saying hello to you and your family. Please do, please do. And thank you. Thank you again for having me. I'll continue the, the mission, you guys' mission too. Thank the, you. The fight is won when we do it, when we do it together. Anyway. It, it's all about being together, right? And uh, we will make sure that uh, if people want to get in touch with you, we'll again, we'll leave information uh, about how people can um, see you on social media and email and, and the website. So we'll make sure we promote that properly. But Marcus, thank you so much for joining Believe in Progress. Um, that's what we're about, believing in progress. And yes, it could be mental health, but yes, it could be in curing cancer. And uh, you're, uh, you're a great guy, and I really appreciate your time today. Thank you. Thank, thank you guys for having me. Thanks, Marcus. Once again, thank you to our listeners, supporters, and donors. Remember, your support drives the progress against cancer. Please consider subscribing to our podcast sharing this episode with a friend, and heading over to our website, aacr.org, to consider making a donation. When you donate to the American Association for Cancer Research, your investment in life-saving research propels the important work of the more than 54,000 members of the AACR in driving progress against cancer. You can support life-saving cancer research with any donation you make today. Thank you for listening to Believe in Progress, the AACR Foundation podcast. This podcast is produced by CollegeCast LLC. Please visit www.collegecastpodcast.com for more information. And remember, cancer research saves lives.